Steve, are we ready? Good morning. I'm John Surick with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I'd like to thank those in the room for participating, and also I'd like to thank those who are partic participating online. The press conference is being streamed uh, to allow reporters across the region uh, to participate. We're going to start with some brief remarks from Will Baker, the president of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Dr. Spencer Phillips, an economist and co-author of the report, and Dr. Luke McDonald, deputy director of the Johns Hopkins Water Institute. Also with us to answer any technical questions is Dr. Beth McGee of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. After opening remarks, we'll take questions, alternating between people in the room and people online. For those online, please include your name, affiliation, and your question. Let's get started, Will. Thanks, John. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. So, oh, oh whoops. Uh, good answers to tough questions. Those are the wrong set of notes, sorry. <laughs> uh, we're here today to put aside the age-old debate of the environment versus the economy. This report, the economic benefits of cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay, clearly demonstrates that the environment and the economy are simply two sides of the same coin. You cannot have one without the other. As John said, I'm joined by Dr. Spencer Phillips and Dr. Beth McGee, the principal authors of the report, and Dr. Luke McDonald, who will all be available for some remarks and questions after I finish putting this into context. Think of saving the bay as more than just seafood abundance. Saving the bay is a metaphor for achieving a high quality of life across the 64,000 square mile watershed and all 17 million inhabitants. <clears throat> to do this, we need clean air, clean water, and healthy land. Just like a three-legged stool, the air, the water, and the land must function as nature designed if we are to achieve that high quality of life for all the residents. Clean water and air and healthy land-based resources. Without all three, the stool will simply not stand. Yes, success will be difficult, but the benefits to society are powerful motivators. They are threefold. Environmental benefits, human health benefits, and as this report clearly proves, economic benefits. The environment, human health, and the economy are fundamental to our communities. Not separate, but interwoven like the fabric of a tapestry. And now, for the first time in history, we have a highly credible, peer-reviewed study which documents the Bay's huge contribution to our regional economy. This peer-reviewed report follows standard economic protocol. Our methodology is not unique, and in fact, many similar economic analyses have been published across the country and even the world. But again, this is the first of its kind for the Bay. Let me give you the headlines, and then I'll let Dr. Phillips fill in the details. The baseline value is over 107 billion, billion with a B, annually. And I might note here that at every juncture, Dr. Phillips and Dr. McGee use the most conservative choice, the most conservative assumptions, so as to ensure a high level of credibility in the report. The report documents that the additional value of a saved bay is $22 billion more than the baseline each and every year for a total of nearly $130 billion annually. A saved bay will return more than $22 billion every year to our regional economy year after year after year. These benefits include 
air and water filtration, agriculture and seafood production, property values, flood and hurricane protection, and more. Let me give you the numbers by state. 8.3 additional value, 8.3 billion additional value in Virginia. 6.2 billion annual additional value in Pennsylvania and 4.6 billion for Maryland. Now before I introduce Dr. Phillips, I would like to acknowledge the generosity of Albert Williams who made our report possible and to thank our peer reviewers, Dr. Gerald Kaufman of the University of Delaware, Dr. Valerie Esposito of Champlain College, Dr. Tanya Brasino of Earth Economics, and Dan Neese of the University of Maryland Environmental Finance Center. They put a lot of time into it and we're very grateful. Dr. Phillips is a natural resource economist with more than 20 years of experience researching the relationship between ecosystems and economic well-being. You can read more about Dr. Phillips on the back of the report. Dr. Beth McGee has been CBF's senior water quality scientist since 2003. She has a BA in biology from the University of Virginia, an MS in ecology from Delaware, and a PhD in environmental science from the University of Maryland. And Dr. Luke McDonald. Dr. McDonald is the deputy director of the Johns Hopkins Water Institute, a division of the Bloomberg School of Public Health. He received his PhD in 2010 from Princeton in civil and environmental engineering. He joined the former Global Water Program, which has now evolved into the Water Institute, a multidisciplinary research enterprise. We'll begin first with Dr. Phillips and then Dr. McDonald, and we'll open it up for the tough questions, which Dr. McGee will handle. <laughs> Dr. Phillips. Thank you, Will. I'm told I'm to spell my name. It is S-P-E-N-C-E-R and two L's then in Phillips with an S at the end. So thank you for those kind remarks about the and the summary. So that's the really big picture. My job is to explain a little bit of how we got to those numbers and give you a couple of examples. Uh, most people do understand that uh, clean water, the benefits of a natural world are useful to them. Clean water to drink, clean water to boat on, clean air to breathe, productive land and waters. They provide food, they provide recreational opportunities, they provide the basis for our psychological well-being, our physical well-being, uh, the value of our property, the value of the production systems that feed our jobs and our income uh, throughout the region. What we've done in this research is to apply established methods to estimate the monetary value of those improvements in environmental quality that the clean water blueprint has been modeled or has been, is expected to uh, provide in the Bay region. The method we use is very analogous to what goes on when you go to buy a house and the bank or somebody else sends an appraiser out to look at the property that you're buying and they also look at a bunch of other properties called the comps to get a handle on what the, prop what the value of your property is. The idea is the bank doesn't want to loan you more money than your house is worth and be overextended. So your appraiser is going to look at other properties that are of a similar vintage, that are of a similar size, that are located in areas that are more or less the same, maybe in the same kind of neighborhood, same kind of construction, that sort of thing. What we've done here, our comps, come from re the results of many, many other studies, more than 70 other studies that uh, Earth Economics helped us to sift through and look at and filter through to find the ones that were most like the Chesapeake Bay in some important aspects. They were estuaries, the studies came from other parts of the country or other parts of the world that were similar economically to us here in the region. Uh, some came from very close by. They came from nearby neighborhoods like the Delaware Bay or from the state of New Jersey. Others came from a little bit farther afield, but all were reasonably close to be comparable to the Chesapeake Bay. And as, as Will mentioned, like a conservative banker, we took the bottom end of those comps to use as our estimates of the per acre value of land and waters in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We didn't want to overblow these numbers, so we were conservative at each point along the line. 
So we used those comps and we started with an estimate of the baseline value of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. That was, that was the baseline scenario that, that Will mentioned. And we looked at just eight of about two dozen potential natural benefits that uh, would result from the clean water blueprint. We wanted to get the one, pick the ones that were most, um, most closely related to changes in water quality, changes in land management practices that would produce that water quality. We looked at seven different land uses, which you can read about in the report, but they included agriculture, forestry, urban developed land, urban open space, wetlands, and open water, and then sort of uh, rock and ice barren, barren areas, a very small portion of this region. And we looked at two f future scenarios. Business as usual, what would happen if no further estimates or no further efforts were made to implement the clean water blueprint. Everything that's in place stays in place. Good stuff is still happening in the Bay. Uh, and we projected what that would be. And then we looked at the clean water blueprint, full implementation of the phase two watershed implementation plans at the state levels and all of the other things that go along with the, with the new uh, water quality uh, goals. There are two things that drive changes in both of those scenarios. One is land use change continued development, conversion of uh, farmland and forest land to urban areas and built up areas. And there's also changes in land management that results in less pollution, leaving the land and ultimately ending up in the, some of it in the waters of the bay. So under both the business as usual scenario and the blueprint scenario, we, we looked at both of those factors. The reductions in water, improve, I'm sorry, reductions in pollution resulting in improvements in water quality are uh, felt most keenly in the Bay. I mean, looking out here, this, that is some of the result that you're looking at or that would be expected. But a lot of the results also occur upstream, which is why in this study, we didn't just look at what happens in the main stem of the Bay, the water that we're looking at and the places immediately upstream in the tributaries, the tidal part of the Bay, but we looked throughout the entire watershed. Because if you're taking measures on farmland on forest land in an urban area like Lancaster County where I used to live, that's making life better for folks up there too. You've got more trees, you've got less pollution, you've got cleaner streams to fish in, to paddle on and so forth. It's not just what ends up down here at the bay. The combination of those changes, changes in land use, changes in pollution loadings, reductions in pollution loadings under the blueprint especially, are what produce the increases in natural benefits that we estimated. And land that is healthier, land that's more productive, that's what's driving the changes. So that $20 billion difference, roughly, is coming from those two separate factors. Just a couple of examples. The open waters, we'll start down here with the bay. The open waters of the Chesapeake Bay and its uh, tributaries become cleaner under the blueprint. And among other benefits, the scientific literature suggests that cleaner water will mean more productive, uh, more production of fin and shellfish for food for food consumption. We also expect that land areas, like farm fields and wetlands, will become more productive. More ducks to hunt, more ducks to eat, more, um, more healthy livestock to, to service food as well. And all told, we estimate that 10%, there will be a 10% increase in that food value produced by the natural systems across the watershed. That's $1.2 billion per year in additional food value relative to the baseline. That's under the blueprint scenario. A cleaner bay and cleaner rivers and streams even farther upstream, all the way to New York, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, throughout Virginia and Maryland, also mean more value for recreationists. There are more fish to catch in those cleaner streams, so even if you're not eating them, if you're just catching and releasing, there's more, also more pleasant water for boating. There's healthier habitats that are good for birders, good for hunters, good for sightseers. We estimate an increase in recreational value of an, another $2.1 billion or a 33% increase relative to the baseline. And finally, getting even farther upstream and upland, uh, we look at the ways that a healthier landscape protects people and property from flooding and the consequences of less severe ups and downs in the water supply. We ecological economists call that the water regulation function of ecosystems, but you can think of it as not getting flooded. There are farms and forests and even urban areas that are going to be doing a better job of holding back the water along with the pollution and slowing it down, which means that you get a heavy rain event such as in Hurricane Irene or Tropical Storm Lee from a couple of years ago, less flooding damage is going to occur as a result of those uh, types of events. 
And so if you, if you look at those benefits from the water regulation, you get an additional $3.4 billion in value, and that's an increase of 17% relative to the baseline. So the difference between the value generated under the blueprint and what would be expected under the business as usual scenario is bigger for food and for recreation of those two examples. It's because under the business as usual scenario, water quality will continue to decline um, and the food production and the recreational value, I'm sorry, the food production and the water regulation will, be, will decline and there'll be a bigger gap. Recreation under the business as usual scenario, however, does increase a little bit, but not by nearly as much as under the blueprint. So if you dig into the details of the report, you'll see that business as usual, yeah, some stuff, good stuff still happens, but under the blueprint scenario, that's when the really good stuff happens to a much greater degree, and that's where the real benefits come in. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. McDonald, and we'll hear a little bit about public health. Well, okay, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I'm not, I'm actually quite used to spelling my name, so it's Luke MacDonald, M-A-C-D-O-N-A-L-D, and so I have to spell my name everywhere I go, and I'll say MacDonald, M-A-C, and they'll say, mm, I can't find you in the system, and they'll say MacDonald, M-A-C, and they'll say, ah, I was spelling it M-C, so um, I'm really actually grateful for this because I know it will be printed uh, properly. But anyways, I'm here today uh, to congratulate the foundation on a, a extremely important report uh, and to congratulate Dr. Phillips and Dr. McGee on what is a strong analysis and a beautifully written and presented document. So I think that these kinds of reports are quite useful in promoting change uh, that can benefit all of us. And the proposition is quite simple. Um, I'm here as a representative of the Johns Hopkins University Water Institute, of which I'm the deputy director, but also I'm a scientist in the School of Public Health where we look at the connections between human health and the environment. And this document, I think, captures that synthesis beautifully. So I'd like to highlight two areas in which I see strong connections to human health coming out of uh, the blueprint. And so one is in air quality. So planting trees and so on has tremendous value. We've already talked a little bit about the property values inherited in that, the aesthetics of it. I like trees. They're very pretty to look at. But there, it's more than that. Planting trees helps to uh, reduce the urban heat island effect, which would prevent heat strokes in extreme events. Planting trees helps to improve air quality. Asthma is a leading cause of illness in urban environments like Baltimore, other parts of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And it's just so important to look at this from an integrated perspective of both the environment and the human health outcomes. I'd also like to highlight the ways in which water quality plays a role in human health. So we're used to thinking about water quality for the environment, fish kills, harmful algal blooms. But cleaner waters mean safer places for our children to play in. It means less risk of exposure for those who have to work closely with the water. So human exposure to pathogens through our waterways can be a significant health problem. Uh, to highlight one of those, there's the Vibrio species, the so-called flesh-eating bacteria. And those have clear links to water quality. So following a plan like the blueprint, we expect to see some improvements in these indicators, which I think is a tremendous step forward. And with that, I think I'll um, take a seat. Thank you very much. Dr. McDonald, Dr. Phillips, thank you. I now open it up to questions. I know we have uh, the opportunity for people online, John, to ask questions as well as here. This question is from Annie Snyder of Greenwire. She asks, can you walk us through the specifics of what is going on with the agricultural slice here? What are the benefits associated with it? And what are the assumptions about how much land is staying in farming versus being converted? She reads that we looked at these changes in terms of ecosystem services, uh, but how about what these changes mean for farmers? How much of that economic benefit is the farmer personally seeing? So I think, Beth or Dr. Phillips, what I heard is more about the specific attributes for the agricultural sector, how much benefit to food production from the uh, blueprint. Great. So hi, uh, Beth McGee, Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Um, there are many ways that agriculture will benefit from implementing the blueprint. Um, a big uh, something that the USDA has been pushing recently is about soil health. 
um, which will mean healthier soils, which means uh, uh, resistance to drought, so less likelihood that you'll lose crops to drought. And in fact, increased soil health can actually um, improve productivity, so actually more cropland, higher yields. Um, and soil health has improved many ways through the blueprint by doing conservation tillage, cover crops, et cetera. On the livestock side, we know from real experience that fencing livestock out of streams will improve herd health. They're less likely to get sick and um, from drinking dirty water from, from cows being uh, in waters upstream. So we actually think one of the really great outcomes of this report is that we really do see tangible benefits for farmers in terms of increased productivity and increased um, efficiency of, of farming practices. I might just add, uh, with a very specific example, I was out on a farm uh, near Harrisonburg, Virginia, about a month ago, and the farmer who has fenced uh, his cattle out of streams for years talked about the benefit to birthing uh, cows and how often those who are not fenced out of streams will actually lose a calf in the stream uh, during birth. Uh, the, ca the calf simply can't get out of the stream, uh, and that's $1,000 a pop. So that's a direct economic benefit to the farmer of doing a very significant environmental practice. Christine? I have a question from Rex Springston. He is from the Times-Dispatch, and he asks a few things. One is, what is the journal you hope to publish your study in? What was the cost of the study? And then he says, costs should go down as capital projects are built, correct? For capital projects, are you talking about things like sewage treatment plant improvements getting built? Good. I'll take uh, at least one or two of those. <clears throat> uh, Rex, the, um, the cost of the study, independent of accounting for the hundreds, if not thousands of hours I spent on this study, <laughs> was about fifty to seventy five thousand dollars so fifty to seventy five thousand were the out of pocket costs to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation I'll, uh, I'll let Spencer or um, Beth answer the others the asked he asked about what journal do we hope to have this study published in and then a question about the diminishing capital costs uh, as the blueprint is implemented We, Beth and I were just talking about that on the way down to the conference room. We're, Ecological Economics, which is a premier journal for this sort of study, uh, is a really good, possibly first candidate for us, but we might be looking to, to those that are focused more on estuarine ecosystems or something more on the natural side of things so that we can get natural scientists to think more about the economic side as well. Uh, and then, of course, on the economic side, there are land economics, journal environmental management, some others. But we haven't, we haven't figured out exactly which one we're going to shoot for, for publication. As for the capital costs, we did not specifically build in any kind of assumptions about, well, actually costs at all, uh, including capital costs and how rapidly they would depreciate or how fast uh, they would be paid back over time. What, what we were attempting to do here was kind of fill a vacuum in the information out there about the clean water blueprint, which is to tell us what kind of benefits are we actually talking about? Uh, we understand that a number of people have been concerned about costs and talking about costs, everything from capital projects such as uh, sewage treatment plants to the changes practices on farmland and forest land and so forth, but nobody was really talking about the benefit side. And you can't have a one-sided conversation about the value to people without talking about the benefits to people, and that's where we wanted to fill in. Thanks. And I just might add uh, for Rex and others, um, the, the, the costs, um, you know, there have been numbers thrown all around for years. Generally, what I've seen is somewhere in the $5 billion range at the high end uh, of costs on an annual basis. So even if you, if you assume that and took that, we're still talking to a better than four to one uh, return on investment. So very good news there. Okay, and this is a question from Pat Ferguson of the Capital Gazette, trying to simplify for the, the readers the economic valuation component. Could you take one of the eight ecosystem services and walk through how a dollar value is derived from it or assigned to it? Spencer, thank you. 
That's a great question, and uh, boy, I hope I am going to be able to assign this to my econ students at UVA or Goucher so that they can get it too. But um, take, for example, recreation. So as I mentioned in my opening remarks, cleaner water means you have more fish in the streams, you have more pleasant water to look at, more pleasant water to stand in while you're fishing, for example. And with cleaner water, you would have more fishing success, or if you're like me, you don't have any fishing success, but you enjoy the experience more. <laughs> and so the value of the experience goes up. So think about it. If you were going to pay a guide $100 a day to go out and have a, a fishing experience, whether from a boat or wading a stream, and you go out and the, the water is dirty, you might catch a disease from it, as Dr. McDonald was saying. Uh, there are no fish in it because it, it is eutrophied. You might feel like you got ripped off or that you weren't wise in, in spending your $100 on that fishing experience. On the other hand, if you knew that you could go to another stream, maybe the same stream five years from now or 10 years from now, and it would be clear, sparkling water full of trout, full of other species that you're interested in, beautiful birds and other species to look at while you're at it, you might be willing to pay $150 for that experience, $200 for that experience, even after you take it into account your bad experience the first time. And the difference between those two is one of the ways of figuring out what the benefit of cleaner water is. And so what we did in this study, we found studies like that, that looked at the recreational value of fishing in cleaner water or the food value of growing uh, growing or harvesting food from cleaner water or what have you, and saying, okay, if we see an improvement of a certain percentage in the water quality of the bay, let's apply that percentage to an improvement in the health and the productivity of the land or the water, and then we multiply that times that additional value that you get from the cleaner, the cleaner water or the, the, the value of the experience. And so you have a number of acres that are producing a quantity of productivity or of of health, and then you have the value that's associated with those acres. And if you have more health, more productivity, more value that comes out of it. Thanks. I have trouble just being quiet, don't I? I might add. <laughs> uh, you know, think of the other side of the equation, too. Um, you know, I was struck, as many of us were, by Toledo this summer. Think of a major metropolitan area in which the residents are told not only can they not drink their water, they have to avoid any water contact whatsoever by what's coming out of their faucet. And the problem, exactly what's happening out here in the Chesapeake Bay and in the rivers that supply drinking water to residents around this region, too much nitrogen and phosphorus creating toxic forms of algae that are dangerous to human health. So, is not only things that will benefit, but uh, costs that are deferred as well when we look at the economic benefits of implementing the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint. Christine, unless we have any other questions that have come in online, we're going to be putting up various graphics for those of you online uh, as soon as this ends, so you can access those. But with no other questions, we will call the press conference to an end. Thank you very much. And thanks very much to Dr. McGee, Dr. McDonald, and Dr. Phillips. Thank you. Good morning.